Yeesh. All right. Nice job. Got it. <laughs> cool. Well, let's kick off this morning with our quote. That's an easy one. It's a quick one. Yeah. You don't have to be an expert to be worthy of success. Mm. I like that. I like that. I think, uh, you know, we do have newer agents that sometimes don't want to get going or start talking to clients because they don't feel like they know enough. Mm -hmm. And what and, if I get asked a question I don't know the answer to? Yeah, wow. Yeah, uh, those of us been in business for a handful of years or more all know that it takes a long time to feel like you're an expert. And I don't know if we ever are true <laughs> at the end. I mean, there's always learning. So it depends yeah. on what the definition of expert is, but uh, that's why we're here. We got your back. You're newer to the business. Uh, be trustworthy, be honest. Uh, and you all know my saying, disclose, disclose, disclose. <laughs> we'll all be good. <laughs> uh. Hey, good morning, Greg. Glad you're on here. So, agent referrals? Yeah, thank you guys so much for referrals. We really appreciate them. Always appreciate new people coming on board. Great referrals. Um, so, Najud, thank you for referring Eric and Janet Moore, referring Oksana and Shelly Carlisle, referring Michael Hawksworth. So, again, thanks so much. Uh, I know you guys do your business by referral, uh, mm -hmm. and so do we. So, that's awesome. We got people coming on because we're going to be jumping right into the meat yeah. of this. So yeah, I know most of you are here not just to see us, <laughs> I'd love to think that, but to learn about the new 2022 contract changes and the new forms that we have um, coming out. So last year, the contract to buy and sell did not have any revisions to it. So we had a new contract introduced in 2019. It stayed the same last year. Last year, we had revisions to the contract, um, or excuse me, the exclusive right to buy and the exclusive right to sell. So this year, contract to buy and sell is changing, but those buyer agencies listing agreements, those are not changing. So um, do we want to dive straight into the CBS? Let's do it. All right. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to screen share the contract to buy uh, real estate, the residential form, the income form, the land form, and the foreclosure form and the commercial form have all had similar changes, but we're just going to go through and model this one because everything else mirrors off of this one. We are going to, as we always do, send out a sales meeting recap email that will likely hit your inbox tomorrow. In that, we're going to have all of these redline contracts linked. So if you're wondering, how do I get access to this? You can get it from our email. You can also go to the DORA website and download it. They have them all available, but these do not start until January 1st. So you won't be using them until then, but it's good to familiarize yourself. So, And this is a overview. Yes. I mean, I would highly encourage you to take a contracts class. Um, they're being offered. They just started here a week or so ago. They are being offered. So I mm -hmm. would highly encourage you, but in the event you don't take one and we get to 2022 and you're writing up a deal and you've not seen it, you'll at least be familiar <laughs> with some of the changes. Exactly. So, yeah. And there's a lot of changes. So like Todd said, we're going to highlight the most important ones. Um, there's been a few just like clerical things that they've cleaned up, changed punctuation, removed a few words. We're not going to hit all of that. We're just really going to get into the meat and what you're going to want to know. But yeah, taking a three hour contract class um, is going to be a really good idea this year. I think you'll benefit a lot from it. Great. Which one would you like to start with? So um, we're going to jump into section 2.5, which is the inclusion section. And I would say that this is the one section that had the biggest overhaul, um, predominantly because of solar panels. Yep. We're seeing a lot more solar panels in the marketplace, whether they're owned by the seller, whether they're mortgaged by the seller, or whether they're leased. Um, and so there have been a lot of changes that have been added in uh, for solar panel purposes. So the boxes that you see um, did not change for solar panels, water software, security system, satellite system. You're going to see that in the middle of your screen. Those are still only to be used if the seller owns these. Um, so they are not, they do not have any sort of a lease attached to them. Leased items are going to go in a different section. So none of that changed. 
The other inclusions toward the bottom of your screen, um, which is now going to be section 2.5.3, that still stayed the same. So that's where you put all your kitchen appliances, washer, dryer, all of that um, did not change. So where we see our changes is in section 2.5.4, which is encumbered inclusions. So rather than having to put solar panels in the due diligence document section, we're still gonna reference that section um, a little bit later on, but now you have a designated area to notify whether the seller has solar panels that they own, but are mortgaged, or I guess financed is the word we'll use. Debt. Yeah. Encumbered means debt. So yep. yeah, if they're encumbered, they're owned, but there's, Payment due. Exactly. So, yeah. so this new section reads, any inclusions owned by the seller, for example, solar panels, must be conveyed at closing by seller free and clear of all taxes, liens, and encumbrances except. So that's where you'll put in there um, whether they have a lien against them. So um, section 2.5.7 is going to be where you would list items that are leased. So for example, solar panels that are leased and have those monthly payments rolling through on them as well. So that just acknowledges that that lease is going to be transferred to the new buyer at closing. What other things could go in here? I mean, so it's solar panels, uh, alarm systems, yeah, security, security systems. systems. So again, it's personal property. Yep. Owned would be 2.5.4, leased 2.5.7. Please do not put occupancy leases in here. If it's a tenant occupied property, that is not where the information goes. It'll go later in the contract and we'll specifically point that out. This is for personal property that's leased. Water softener might be another thing oh, yeah, um, yeah. that would be included in that. So that was the big change. Huge change. Huge change. And I think it's going to be really, a welcomed, really- <laughs> A welcome change because we get so many questions on- what I do with solar and whose responsibility and what if, what if, what if. Yeah. Clarify upfront. Perfect for you guys. Yeah. And so this will um, really come into play when you're listing properties to know, you know, ask those questions to your seller because it's going to come up in the contract to buy and sell, um, whether there's, you know, a lien against it, whether it's owned free and clear, and then that's going to help you guys fill in these sections. But um, that'll be really helpful because <laughs> there have been a lot of, uh, expectations yeah. um that we thought were set with contracts and then you get to the closing table and the buyer's going wait a minute i didn't know there was an outstanding balance so now it's painted very clearly for you so and if you guys have questions on anything as we're going yes please post them in the yeah in comment section and uh, we'll try and juggle back and forth again this isn't extremely in depth but uh so yeah try not to get on some wild tangent that uh, would be too hard for us to explain uh happy to talk to you on the but phone yeah. if you have something going on right now but yeah if there's something we miss uh clarification please type it in the comment section yeah and we'll definitely keep an eye on those so all right perfect so um the next thing is going to be under your water and well section um they added in a new paragraph in section 2.7.6 called water rights review and buyers will now have the opportunity to mark a checkbox does or does not if they want to have the opportunity to terminate should the water rights review not go the way they expected. So if you're representing a buyer, does. Just always mark does. Does. They, they should always have that, that right. And again, this is only going to really come up on maybe wells or you know properties mm -hmm. that are outside of the city limits. We really don't have issues with water rights, but uh, default does. Exactly. So hand in hand, um, because there are some new terminology in this contract, we have new dates and deadlines. Um, there are gonna be some things that have been added, a few things that have been changed, and this water rights examination deadline as referenced in section 2.7.6 is gonna be one of those items. Uh, but we're gonna take it from the top. And we're going to talk about the time of day deadline, which I'm really I excited like this. about yeah. this one. I don't know how many of you guys have been in a similar scenario where it's 10 o'clock at night, you have an inspection objection that you're trying to negotiate, and you're like, oh my gosh, why can't we, we be working normal business hours, five o'clock, six o'clock? Why can't we have a deadline that's a little bit sooner? 
The forums committee has heard us plead and they have put in a time of day deadline. Um, how the market embraces this, I'm excited to see. I'm hoping that there is going to be a commonality that we all decide 6 p.m. is going to be our time of day deadline rather than the current 1159. Um, this is going to be something you'll want to keep an eye on if you're running multiple transactions, because if one buyer puts a time of dead day deadline of 4 p.m., another one has an 8 p.m., you're going to have to really keep track of when those deadlines are occurring so that you're not missing one. So, so yeah, you might, I mean, it might be a business practice of yours if you're a, a very busy agent to always ensure that all of your contracts are 6, 6 p.m., PM, 7 p.m., 5 p.m., whatever. And you just know that that's your business practice and you ensure whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, you counter, you write it up originally, that you're in control of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure most people will wanna go along not making this 1159. Um, but it doesn't apply to, to every everything. single thing. And that's why I did scroll down and skip some things. We'll go back up. But if you look at 3.3.1, it again talks about what a day means, but it does go in except however time of day deadline specified above, like we said, all objection deadlines, resolution deadlines, examination deadlines, and termination deadlines will end on a specified deadline date. That's the date that you put. If time of day deadline is blank, then it goes to 1159. So if you didn't put it in there, it's going to be 1159. Exactly. So let's explain that. <laughs> because some things are missing from those specified terminations that we set. Yes. So any milestone on the date and deadline chart that has objection, resolution, examination, or termination in the title follows the time of day deadline. If it is a delivery document, such as a title commitment delivery, survey delivery, due diligence document earnest delivery, money. earnest money. It will never follow that time of day. It will always be an 11.59 p.m. deadline. The theory behind that is we can't hold appraisers, title companies um, to a specific deadline of 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. They need to have an entire day to make sure that they can fulfill their obligations and roles an HOA. We can't tell the HOA they need to have HOA documents by 6 p.m. They have through that entire day to make sure that those documents get in the hands of the buyer. So yeah, that's important. Yep. So just know when you're working with inspection objections, appraisal, um, you know, loan is not one that is in there. Yeah. So it's going to follow that 11.59 p.m. But for all of your objection resolution, termination, and examination deadlines, you'll know that once you hit that time of day deadline, if you put one in, that it's going to follow that. So that's kind of nice. You won't be up till 11 o'clock at night wondering, <laughs> did the seller sign the resolution? <laughs> Actually, I think we want to just, are we going to skip all these? Um, nope, I think you we're going to go. Which ones do you want to hit? Yeah, go. so let's go straight down. Um, tax certificate, there's just one thing that I want to mention about that. Record title, deadline, and tax certificate go hand in hand. They actually added that into the title of the milestone. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the tax certificate um, in further pages because it now does give you the opportunity to check whether the buyer's paying for a tax certificate or the seller's paying for a tax certificate. Um, third party first writer refusal, or excuse me, the first writer refusal deadline was changed to third party to purchase an approval deadline. Um, we won't we'll go, go into too we'll much detail right now. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit further down. Um, new loan. That changed significantly. Big change. And we'll get to that. Yep. So your new loan um, termination has gone away. It's now going to be broken into two milestones, a new loan terms and a new loan availability. We then have the addition of two new milestones, water rights examination and mineral rights examination. We'll talk about those. And then our inspection termination, inspection objection, they changed the order of those on your date and deadline chart. And there's a particular reason for that. So we'll hit on that as we get into those paragraphs as well. So we just went over that, went over the day's computation. So we're good there. Yep, and I'm just gonna check, make sure we don't have any questions. Again, drop your questions in the comment section if you have any, and we'll keep going. Go ahead. So um, 
there was just a terminology change in the title of return of earnest money to disposition of earnest money, but the significant change is in this section, it typically outlines what the buyer's rights were, and now it actually puts in something that relates to the seller. And we get this question a lot. We had a termination, I signed the release of earnest money, how long did it? It's always been in the contract, but just gonna go over it one more time. Within three days of seller's receipt is when they're supposed to return the earnest money and sign the form. Yep. Does it, I just had a phone call two nights ago from another broker asking me what to do. Sometimes the seller is really disappointed that mm -hmm. someone's backing out. And I always say, give them in a couple extra days before you start going crazy and calling yep. attorneys. And because I'd say 98% of the time, this all works out, earnest monies get released when someone is doing it properly and they weren't, you know, uh, getting out of a contract uh, with bad faith, but truly had the, the right to do it. So that's one comment, just mm -hmm. give some space. But if they don't release it, there are consequences in here. Uh, so we've got 4.3.2.1, seller failure to timely return and earnest money. And then 4.3.2.2, if the buyer doesn't return the earnest money. And I just want to mention that it does tell you to go to 20 and 21 and kind of says what happens. This does not define who's wrong, yep. who's right. It just pretty much at the end of the day says, look, you can mediate, you can arbitrate. And if you find that the seller should have returned it, you can go after some specific performance. You can go after some damages. If you find that the buyer was in the wrong well obviously you can go after their earnest money and that's all they're ever liable for mm -hmm. so it just kind of says yes you can go after both parties but it, it there is no clearly defined this is what happens mm -mm. it still always goes down to mediation arbitration or you always have the opportunity to call an attorney and file a lawsuit exactly so don't look for the answer who's wrong and this is what happens this just says Either party can recover damages. Exactly. And I think this is an important section and another reason they spell this out for you to go over with your buyers and sellers so they know what expectations are. Um, and it just gives you more talking points when you're drafting these offers with your clients to make sure that they're fully aware of their responsibilities in this transaction. All right, so moving on down, um, there was just a really minor change to section 4.5.3. And I'm actually kind of happy to see this because our listing agreements have this language in it, but it's never been in the contract to buy and sell. So when a buyer has an FHA or a VA loan, sometimes there are fees and closing costs that the buyer's not legally allowed to pay and the seller has to absorb those. Um, one example on a VA loan, the buyer cannot pay the document storage and access fee. Most of the time, the realtor eats that fee. However, you can put in here a dollar amount. If there are fees that the loan type won't allow, the seller would be responsible for $100, $200, $500, $1,000. So you can put a dollar amount in there and then the sellers can absorb those fees. They're very few and far between, but it gives you that option. So. Progressing. Let's get into this That's new loan. loan terms and new loan availability. So we no longer have loan termination. <laughs> it's going to be really hard. This is going to be a, <laughs> to change a, a big change. Yeah, to change our frame of mind. Do you want to explain this one, or do you want me to? I want you to explain it. <laughs> okay. So I'll back you up. <laughs> new loan terms. Okay. There's gonna be questions on this one. I'm gonna try my hardest to paint a good picture. I've got this. So. so new loan terms are anything that has to do with the buyer's interest rate, closing costs, loan amount, conditions of the loan. That is now gonna have a deadline and it's probably gonna be in the first three to five days of the contract period. Because what was happening and the reason this sparked is sometimes buyers were getting up to a couple of days before closing and pulling the plug and saying it was related to the interest rate. I don't like my interest rate anymore, or I don't, I don't want to put as much money down the terms of my loan. I'm not 
agreeable with. And that really wasn't the issue. So now we're firming this up and committing buyers on the front end. You know what? You're getting your good faith estimate from your lender within a couple of hours of applying for your loan. You can decide whether your interest rate, your loan terms meet your expectation. So that's a good thing for sellers. Yeah, we're trying to limit that sole discretion that they yeah. had. I can just back out because I don't like it. So we're trying to tighten that thing up a little bit. When I was in Oregon, what I really liked is this section of something different back then that wasn't called this, but we actually said, what interest rate are you trying to get and you won't go over? Mm -hmm. So you would put an in interest rate, no greater than 3.5. And what term? 30, 30 years. years. Convention. So we, I mean, we narrowed it down. This is getting closer to that. We're at least saying at the end of the road, like Stacy said, you don't get to say at my sole uh, discretion, I don't like these things need to be checked off so that when we get towards the end mm -hmm. and you hear wind, again, you know, this is gonna be a, you find out, meaning the listing agent or the seller finds out that somebody backed out of a deal for one of these reasons versus the next section, you might have some recourse. It's still not a ton of teeth, mm -hmm. but at least lets people know look, let's not use this section to As just get out for no reason. Because I've heard a lot of realtors when they sit down with buyers and draft contracts and say, don't worry, I can get you out of this contract on loan termination for any reason. Cold feet. There is not a termination milestone for cold feet, but they tie it in and say, let's just blame it on the loan. So that's going to help um, a little bit. Tighten the screws. So new loan availability is now going to be similar to your loan termination deadline. It's gonna be something that occurs three to five days before closing, maybe a week before closing if you're really trying to draft a strong desirable offer. And that is only going to allow the buyer to terminate if there's something that the lender can't approve them for. I can't get you this loan, the underwriter needs this and you can't produce it. So it's gonna come down to, if the buyer can get the loan, they need to move forward. If they can't actually get their loan, then they can terminate on this. And the big thing that this new paragraph outlines is the reasons you can't terminate. You can't terminate on a low appraisal in this particular right. paragraph that has to be tied to an appraisal deadline. You can't terminate on a conditional sale. So if your previous home doesn't successfully close, you can't terminate based on new loan. That's a whole separate That's milestone. That's a different milestone. And if you didn't mark that in this section, mm -hmm. if you didn't say this was conditioned upon a sale, you're moving from another state or your buyer, it's, everything looks good. It's a hot market. I don't want to say anything. I need a great offer. And we can just back out on loan termination if it doesn't mm -hmm. happen. Again, this is if the seller and the listing agent catch wind, of any of these discrepancies out there, outside of what this says, the new loan, meaning I don't qualify. I lost my job. My FICO score got changed at the last second and mm -hmm. the lender denied, denied me. me. That's how you get out. You catch wind that was something else, you have recourse. And again, none of this is just set in stone. This is simple. I got to keep your earnest money but it's at least holding people's feet to the fire that, look, this is a contract and beyond good faith, this is a contract and we need to move forward and not be just using these little outs because uh, it, especially in a market like this, it, it can be <laughs> very, very costly to someone. Exactly. So read through these paragraphs because they're going to change everything in the way you and your buyers draft these offers and the way the milestones clip off uh, towards closing. So any questions yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm watching for questions here. New it's, loan, it's, difference between new loan terms and new loan availability. I mean, really just look at the title. Terms of your loan versus availability of your loan. And hopefully that helps. Yeah. And good morning, Ray and Sandra and Kevin and <laughs> Julie and Becky and everyone else is joining in here. Yeah, that's, I like that section. Yeah. That, I do too. I never liked that 
So I, I just backing out. I, I don't like it. I, I was like, geez, we can't get down 30 days down the road and then just back out. Yeah. and not have repercussions. Exactly. And no, like Todd said, if a buyer loses a job or gets a pay cut and they can no longer qualify for that loan, that's one thing. Right. But just to say, oh, another house came on the market that I like better, I want to terminate on loan. Not going to happen okay. anymore. So, all right, let's keep moving on um, to our next section. These are all just some minor, minor changes. changes. There's nothing any of any significance in these sections. It's kind of funny. It looks like they actually had typos, like misspellings that yeah. they're fixing. <laughs> so tax certificate section is now 8.5. And I actually haven't seen any fees for tax certificates. So I don't know if they've been rolling them into the title commitment fees, yeah. but there is an opportunity now for you guys to mark who is paying for the tax certificate, seller or buyer. I think the market's going to default probably to seller um, since that is pretty much what the norm's been. So yeah, I think John said a lot of the mountain properties areas uh, kind of run into this. I haven't heard you guys saying that you're running into these mm -mm. here locally. Yeah. So tax certificate is going to be provided with the title commitment. Um, on or before the record title deadline. And then of course the buyer has an opportunity to object if there's something that pops up in that tax certificate that they don't like. And then there is new language added in similar to the title commitment. If the buyer doesn't get it by the record title deadline, there's an automatic 10 day extension. So that the buyer has ample time to, to review that and make sure that they don't have any objections. Uh, so that mirrors very similar to the record title deadline and the language that we see in that section. So third party right to purchase approve. I, I like that they've changed this. However, it's kind of funny that they still use example, right of first refusal. So, still, so this was right of first refusal, which was incorrectly used terminology. Um, so third party right to purchase approve. There are instances that we've ran across this. And so um, to make it simple, let's say a condominium complex um, has the right, the group of people that put the HOA together said, you know what, anytime anyone here sells, we want the right to purchase that first. Mm -hmm. And so that's in the documents, it's in the HOA. Yeah, it's in their bylaws. It's in their bylaws, it's, it, it's, it's known, it's in the deed, you know that this entity, third party entity has the first right refusal to go, we would buy that. Now they don't get to set the price and terms and stuff. They mm -hmm. have to meet the seller's price and terms, but the seller has to say, Hey, I'm going to sell. And this is what I'm going to do. You have the first right. And there's a, a time period in which they have to decide whether or not they want to move forward on that. And so your offer will be contingent. If you're the buyer writing this up contingent upon them, not exercising their right. So that's what this section is in here for and it tells you the time frame that this has to occur in and it says let's see here if the third party right to purchase is exercised or approved this contract has occurred not occurred on or before the third party right to purchase approval deadline this contract will then terminate so you put in the dates the deadlines mm -hmm. and say when this has to happen but make sure that if you're representing the seller mm -hmm that the dates and deadlines follow what's in the bylaws. The bylaws, if, because sometimes this can take up to 30 days. And if you guys are doing a 30 day closing, I mean, you're not gonna have that approval on whether the HOA is gonna buy the property or not. So that gets a little tricky. Yeah. And if you ran across this, put it in here. I, I, I ran into this neighborhood or something. That'd so be I've actually run into it and um, I can't even think of the neighborhood, but it's where Lynn Utter lives. Oh. And so in their bylaws, and this community was established in the 1960s, in their bylaws, 70s, um, it says that the HOA has the right to buy a property um, before it moves on to a new buyer. And they never exercise it. And they're actually trying to amend their bylaws to take that out. And they just haven't been able to do it yet. But we had to send the purchase contract in. And fortunately, it was only a 10-day review period. So the buyer was able to keep clipping along uh, with their current milestones. But yeah, I had that on a recent listing. And there are several condominium complexes that still have this in effect. And I have never once seen the right to purchase exercised. So got to follow the rules, but it's very rare that it will ever happen. Yeah. 
but it's out there. But yeah, be knowledgeable uh, of that. And Julie Felson, yes, we will be updating uh, all of our interactive contracts. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I get the pleasure of doing that. So I'll start working on that next month and get all of our contracts redone. So you have yeah. your examples. Yep. All right. So I think that along with checklists, because there's a few new forms too. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple new mandatory forms. So yeah, it's it'll all be updated. We'll have it done by the first of the year for you guys. Exactly. All right, moving on. So that's not pertinent. That's they not took pertinent. out the first right of refusal. So that just mitigates that. Um, I think the next big change is going to be under section 8.9. And that's where we have this new mineral rights review. Again, I don't know how often. <laughs> Again, this, would be, this is with, you know, large parcels of land or out in the country. Um, obviously, if you're, you're buying 10 acres down in Kiowa or something like that. And if you're concerned about the mineral rights, or if you're concerned about fracking, if you're concerned mm -hmm. about who has the right to go underneath your property, I know down in Castle Rock, there are areas out east, east, yeah, out east, that there's fracking going mm -hmm. on out there. And you might want to know how this affects your property and if it does or not. So this just gives you the right or your buyer the right to uh, terminate uh, mm -hmm. after examining this. And it's not our job or your job uh, to help them with this, that, that this is something that they're going to need to hire someone, an attorney that understands this kind of stuff to take a look at it for them. Yeah. And fortunately, the forms committee did put in a few disclosures at the end of the contract that re that relate to this mineral rights review and the water um, examination deadline to notify the buyer that it is not our job to research this. Um, and gives them some direction on who to consult for that. So you are not to become a mineral rights expert nor a water rights expert because of these changes. And then I can read it on my, let's see. Oh, Doug, Perrin, Perinude, Perinode condos, downtown Denver. So oh, okay. Fun. So yeah. And then Ray, uh, you said, what about the 1% fee Breckenridge charges? Who pays the buyer seller split? Um, so that would be, I think that's a transfer fee that they have up in Breckenridge or something okay, like that. Okay, yeah, and we'll actually get to yeah, that we'll question to because that. there's a section um, which yeah, that does That apply. wasn't the tax district. That's mm -hmm. that's a city thing. Yeah, exactly, but great question. Yeah. So we'll make sure we hit on that here in a couple of minutes. All right, so our big inspection changes um, relate to inspection objection, inspection termination. We still have all three, inspection objection, inspection termination, inspection resolution. But as you saw in the date and deadline chart that we pointed out, they moved to the termination deadline above the objection deadline. Um, one of the kind of real life scenarios that'll help you grasp this concept is uh, we were seeing, uh, it didn't happen often, but it did happen. So say you have an inspection objection deadline on a Monday your inspection resolution and termination deadlines match and they're on a Thursday. And say the buyer and seller agree that there's a, just a couple of items that need to be fixed and they reach a resolution on Tuesday. So prior to the termination and prior to the resolution, they go ahead and button that up with an inspection resolution signed, sealed, delivered. On Thursday, after the resolution's already been signed, the buyer sends over a notice to terminate and marks the inspection box buyer legally has a right to terminate because the inspection termination deadline hasn't passed. The seller says, but we reached an agreement. I said I would do everything that you wanted. You can't terminate. And then there's a big disagreement and we talk about earnest money disputes. So the contract is now structured that you are going to want to draft your termination and your objection deadlines on the same day or your termination deadline before your objection because if you're gonna terminate, you need to terminate. If you submit an inspection objection, your right to terminate or your termination deadline expires. Does that make sense? It makes total <laughs> sense because we saw that before they even launched mm -hmm. the contracts three years ago with the termination deadline. We're like, well, this is, could occur and we're, we're gonna have an issue. I mean, we saw the issue before, before they even, even happened. happened. So. Yeah, they cleaned it up finally, but it makes total sense. If you're going to come together and you came together, well, you shouldn't be able to then cancel it at the last. Yeah, it doesn't make any yeah. sense. So, so they, if, if you have a termination, inspection termination date in the dates and deadline chart, once you submit an inspection objection, that termination <clears throat> expires. So you can't 
come back to that. However, you still have your resolution period right. where the buyer and seller can counter back and forth. And if that agreement isn't reached, contract automatically terminates like it has always um, in these recent contracts that we have on 1159. Well, unless you have a time of day deadline. Right. Could be a six o'clock. <laughs> but it will expire. Or it will um, automatically terminate. So the buyer still has the ability to, in essence, terminate if the seller doesn't agree to make those repairs. They just can't pull the plug after a resolution right. has been reached. So um, the other thing that this section clarifies is if buyer and seller can't reach a resolution and they're butting heads and they say there's no way this deal is going to come together, they don't have to wait till the inspection resolution deadline automatic termination. They can both agree to sign. They can terminate whenever an earnest money release. Yeah. So yeah, if seller says I'm not replacing the roof and buyer says I ain't buying the house unless the roof's replaced, we're not going to see eye to eye. Let's just sign an earnest money release. You can put your home back on the market and I can go find something else. You don't have to wait that out. I find it funny that we had to actually clarify, clarify that because <laughs> I, I think in practice we've been doing that. Yeah. yeah. So but some said, but, well, seller's just gonna sit around and sit, sell it automatically the terminate. Yeah. Well, why yeah. do that? Buyer wants to move on. Yeah. So do you. So that is outlined now, which is great. All right, we're back to leased items. So yeah, back to your, your solar or your water filter system, anything that you checked above that you said you had at least item, this now says documents. If any leased personal properties will be transferred to the buyer closing, seller agrees to deliver the copies of the leases and information pertaining to the personal property. And then the buyer on or before due diligence documents delivery will or will not assume the obligation. So this outlines these lease things. I'm going to get the information. Mm -hmm. I get to review, see if I want to pay for these. I want to take on the liability and on or before due diligence deadline will or will not assume. Yep. I like that. So this is going to be really helpful. You won't show up to a closing table and have a buyer say, I thought the seller was paying it off. And the seller saying, I thought the buyer was absorbing it because we had that happen with an equity agent a few months back. And it's like, what do we do? Right. You guys got to figure it out. And then likewise with encumbered inclusions, again, encumbered means owned, but have a debt on it. Mm -hmm. Any inclusions owned by the sellers that have a debt encumbered, seller agrees to, again, deliver the copies of the evidence of debt. Uh, or no debt, and by due diligence document delivery deadline. So it's the same deadline as the lease. And again, buyer will or will not, not. it's kind of down a little further, will not assume the encumbrance. Yep. So perfect. It just clarifies things. I, we were having to write things in additional provisions. This and is getting tricky. Yeah. Now it's just everybody knows where everyone's at and we all get the chance to review and approve. And if they didn't get something and there is a debt or there is a lease and they never got, well, you, you have a way to get out of the contract as well. Yeah. And then make sure um, that when you're working with buyers who are seeking financing, that if there are solar panels or water softeners or security systems that are leased and the buyer is going to absorb that payment that the lender knows about it because it can um, modify their income to debt ratios and I've actually seen buyers not qualify for their loan because they have to absorb the solar panel um, lease of $30,000 and it throws off their ratios so make sure you communicate that information as well so the lender's aware of it. I'm going to have you pop back up just one paragraph because I did want to point out in 10.6.1.1 1 .1, they clarified that that is the section for occupancy agreements we had written in their current leases and people were putting solar panels and water softeners in there, but it only pertains to occupants in the property. So this is where you have your renters and your tenants and, and you write that information in. So. You guys holding that pretty well? I know it's a lot, it's drinking from a fire hose guys. We're recording this. So in the event that you wanna go back and revisit a couple of sections, um, so this is a fun one. I've actually had these questions come up a few times. Section 12.3, closing. It's now stated that the seller agrees to deliver a set of keys for the property to the buyer. 
doesn't seem like it should be that big of a deal, but you know what? Post-closing Post occupancy, occupancy agreements are attached to so many of these transactions. And as the seller is sitting there at the closing table and the buyer signs everything and the buyer says, graded like a set of keys and the seller says, uh-uh, I'm still in the property for the next 45 days, you don't get access then there can be a little bit of a miscommunication. So now it's spelled out that the seller, even if there's a post-closing occupancy, does have to turn over a set of keys to that buyer because in your post-closing occupancy agreement, it actually spells out that the buyer has the right to access the property with proper notice. So yeah, the, 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 they're the new owners. The seller as a renter yeah. without landlord-tenant rights, but for all intents and purposes, that is not their home anymore. Yeah. It is now the buyer's home and they do have the right to check on it, make sure it's okay with, you know, proper notice. Okay. That's funny to think that people don't want to get the keys over. It's like, it's my house. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm the new owner. I just signed the yeah. documents and funded the loan. So yeah, <laughs> I get a set fine. of keys. <laughs> so it's nice that it spells it out because there have been a couple of buyers at closing tables that are going, well, what's right, what's wrong. So I like that we now can reference the contract. Um, assignment of leases that ties into solar panel stuff again, water softener security system section 12.5. Uh, that is a whole new paragraph. So, all right, section 15 got a total overhaul as well. And this comes back to I don't remember whose question if it was Doug or John or um, but the one percent transfer tax oh, in Breckenridge, Ray. Mm -hmm. Ray, it's going to fall in this section. Um, so they changed some wording, but this is still the section that talks about status letters, um, record change fees from HOAs, if there's any um, local transfer taxes, which are in section 15.4 now, you can mark who's going to pay those at closing. So buyer, seller, one half buyer and seller, or, or something if else. it doesn't apply, yeah. NA. So this gives us a lot more flexibility with a lot of these fees. One of the paragraphs that they added in that I love is uh, take a look at 15.3.3. It's in the middle of your screen. Assessments, reserves, and working capital. Mm. This has been a big deal for a couple of years now. So all assessments required to be paid in advance um, as defined in 16.2, reserves or working capital due at closing must be paid by, and you can specify because Oftentimes these HOAs are collecting a couple hundred dollars working capital to put into the reserves. Typically that buyer gets that money back at closing. Um, but there was some conversation. Buyer of, and seller. Uh, sorry. Well, seller. when the buyer when buys the buyer. it, but when the, when they become a seller, they right. get that back. Some HOAs are keeping that money now. Um, but there was a lot of confusion as to whose responsibility is it to pay the working capital. And now we actually have it outlined. So that's a good one. I like that. So Ray, it, it depends on, you know, how you want to write the offer, but you have the ability to go buyer, seller, or 50-50 mm -hmm. up there in Breckenridge. Yep, exactly. And some of the condo complexes in downtown Denver, mm -hmm. they have those developer fees. Um, then anytime a property changes hands, there's a 1% fee associated. And oftentimes agents will write that in the MLS, buyer to pay 1% transfer tax, negotiable, put it in your contract, negotiate that through. Um, the other unique thing yeah, about section 15, one. and I can't quite figure out the application yet, but obviously they're thinking ahead, um, is in section 15, what's our call number for this one now? 0. 0.7? Uh, that's X'd out. So 15.6, oh. under water transfer fees, there's always been a section there that allows you guys to um, negotiate whether the buyer seller or one half buyer and seller for water transfer fees. There's now a utility transfer fee. So if there's a utility transfer fee from seller to buyer, you can acknowledge who's going to pay that. Now utilities would be gas, electric, mm -hmm. cable, internet. It seems to me that buyers should be responsible for setting up their own utilities. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Maybe you guys can post if you ran into this because I haven't I haven't seen this I haven't one. seen it. I don't know that yeah. XL is charging a $50 transfer, transfer fee. fee when someone new comes into the property, but maybe someone's run into it and you can give us some guidance on that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can't that's... figure this one out. So um, in my opinion, if I'm working with the buyer, I'm just always going to check the buyer box. Um, but again, 
it's up for negotiation. Yeah. You want the seller to absorb those fees. That's a tricky one because not all the time are all utilities transferred prior to closing. So how do you know what those fees are until you get your first bill? I think it could be a mess. It's just, yeah. I mean, and it's not, I mean, it's not a lien on the property. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like water. It, yeah. So yeah, so, it's an anyways, interesting one. We'll, it's there. we'll see how that. <laughs> it's there. We'll you got to mark something. Yeah. Um, these were just all yeah, these were yeah. just kind of cleaning things, cleaning up. things up. We're getting there. We're getting there, guys. So they um, made the recommendation recommendation of legal and tax camp counsel a little more robust. So this is section 19. Now, it has always recommended that buyer and seller seek legal or tax counsel before signing a contract. And it now puts in there that if the property has water rights, mineral rights, leased items, or other areas of concern to consult an attorney, don't rely on. So yeah, we're just trying to take you guys out of the equation here. So if they yep. check, yep, I want to review mineral. Yep, I want to review water rights. They need to get an expert. You know, yeah. That is not, not our realm. Exactly. So, so and this is just, again, that's a protection for you guys. Yeah. And then we had spoken about release of earnest money and what if the seller's in default, what if the buyer's in default, section 20.2.1 and 0.2, uh, just pretty much outline what we had mentioned before that, you know, if the seller's not performing, the buyer does have rights to uh, go after specific performance, even if they're not performing on releasing earnest money. Mm -hmm. So that's not just, you know, specific, specific performance to go after them if they didn't sell their house, but let's just say that they didn't release the earnest money, but you do have the right to go after um, damages for that. Uh, and so the same for the seller it has always had the right to go after a buyer's earnest money. So that just clarifies it in 20.21 and two. And again, it doesn't give you the answer. Okay, this isn't <laughs> something that you show to uh, the dial company and say, look, it says right here that their earnest money goes to the buyer, that we still have mediation, arbitration, and then um, obviously you can always hire an attorney to uh, jump in between the mediation and arbitration. Yeah, and then the other additional line in 20.2.1 that will be beneficial for buyers that have a post-closing occupancy agreement if the seller doesn't get out of the property on time, the buyer can recover damages in addition to the daily per diem that you wrote in that post-closing or in the contract to buy and sell. And I know there have been some issues with sellers not getting out on time when they have a post-closing and the buyer thinks they can only go for that per possession per daily per diem. And they say, well, my moving expenses, my hotel, me be not being able to access the property is a lot more than $300 a day. Um, so it's in addition damages plus the daily per diem, which protects that buyer for those situations a lot better than it did before. So that's a, a good improvement. I think that was the biggies in the contract. Yeah, those are the biggies. The only other thing is they made the end of contract to buy and sell box bigger. bigger <laughs> and they stopped the numbering at that point. So 935 is the last number sequence. And then when you get to the broker acknowledgements, compensation, disclosure, they took out some wording, changed a few things and started um, lettering them. So it's section A rather than section 32. Um, just to remind you guys that this is a disclosure. It is not part of the contract. And they removed that brokers no longer have to cooperate with mediation requests. Interesting. So, however, if you're part of RE Colorado mm -hmm. or you're a realtor, you have, to. you have to still go mediation arbitration via those um, clubs that we belong to. But so. they wanted to drive home the idea that this is not part of the contract, it's merely a disclosure. And then Ray put in, is there something in there about insurance obligation? So what do you mean about insurance Yeah, I mean, we, we've always had the, is the deadline not there anymore for? There's still um, an insurance deadline on the date and deadline chart. I can take a look on my hard copy um, really quick. So property insurance termination deadline. There's still that. 10.5. Mm-hmm. So outside of that, I don't know what your question, if it's deeper than that. Yeah. Right? 
So feel free to text a little more detail in there. We'll keep moving along and I'll keep an eye on this and we'll circle back and answer that. But yeah, those obligations have not been removed. So lead-based paint, woo, little facelift here because of inflation. <laughs> <laughs> the federal fine is not necessarily going to hold at $11,000. So they removed the penalty number and put in adjusted for inflation. So it could be a lot. It could be a lot. So um, <laughs> get those fines. Just, just it's a disclosure. Get yeah. it, get it done. Get it done on time. But yeah, do know that if you don't get it signed and your file is audited, there is a chance you will be penalized. So that was it. Um, seller association authorization, this is just a new form. It allows the seller to give permission to a third party, you or the title company, to pull all of their HOA information. Not a required form, just a nicety. So earnest money release, it was updated just a little bit. We've got um, the earnest money distribution language following the contract language. And the biggest change with this is we used to have you guys check the box under section three so that both parties were mutually releasing. Earnest money was the final settlement and neither party would go after each other for further damages. They reversed it. So if this box is checked, parties do not release each other from liability. So we're no longer checking the box. Obviously case by case scenario. Case by case you may have a buyer that it is in their best interest to pursue the seller for further damages if the seller's in default, but just know that that box checking has changed. I'm excited about this. You love this form. One. Yes. Um, so extension or termination of contract, this is a new form. And what it is for is you are representing the buyer, we'll say, and you need more time for something. Let's say you need more time for, pick a good one, loan application deadline. They, have, they haven't found a lender yet. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for a lender um, and they need another three days to do this or two days to do this. But if the seller doesn't give them time, they don't want to be stuck. So probably even more important than the loan application would be a a loan availability or loan terms where they're really, you know, being tied down to, I don't know if I can get the right loan. I don't know if I can get the right um, terms. And I really need to push this thing out. And that if I can't push this out a day or two, I need to back out the contract. Well, what happens if you do an extension? As we all know, it's an amendment. It has to be agreed upon by everyone to extend something. And you send over the amendment and let's say tonight at midnight, because nobody did the new time, tonight at midnight, my loan terms deadline is going to pass and I'm going to be at risk of my earnest money if I don't get this extension. So I send over this amendment. I'm the agent. I'm sitting here for all night long going, are they going to sign this? 1130, 1145. Yeah. Do I call my buyer? Do we pull the plug? What and, do we and do? We've heard from other agents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're talking to the, so the listing agent and the listing agent says, oh, this will be fine. Yeah. I don't see a problem. Sign it. But you're waiting for the paperwork mm -hmm. and you don't want to lose my earnest money. Well, what this allows you to do is put in the new date and deadline, but in the event that you don't get this back to you and they don't agree to your amendment, you can have this terminate as per the contract. So I've got till midnight tonight for me to either back out and get my earnest money or do an extension and amendment. This allows you to do both at the same time. Here's my extension. If you don't sign it, I'm backing out. I'm getting my earnest money. Yep. I love this. Any questions on that? Did I explain that okay? I mean, I- Yeah, no, it's perfect. So yeah, page one and two are gonna be for the extension. You're gonna extend whatever deadline you're wanting. Page and just the deadline you're wanting. Just so the we got them all in here. So that's, it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many, whatever you need, need to extend. Yep, and just leave everything else and 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 it's gonna stay the same. This does not allow you to modify anything but dates and deadlines. You can't write new terminology. You can't yep. do an additional provision. It is only for date and deadline extensions. And 
then page three is going to be the automatic termination. If it's not signed by 11.59 tonight, buyer terminates on loan terms. Love it. It's a great point. Yeah. So no longer will you have to stay up late wondering if you're going to get your paperwork. You can go to bed knowing it's either getting signed by the seller and tomorrow morning you guys are moving forward or the automatic termination kicked in and the buyer was not at risk of losing the earnest money. So it's fantastic. Yeah. We absolutely love this one. Oh. So that is it for forms. Um, one thing I do want to say, we did not put in counter proposal, amend, extend, notice to terminate, just the regular notice to terminate. All of those changed because we have the new deadline in our date and deadline chart. So they had to match the new names on these other forms. So those forms didn't change um, in format. It's just they updated record title and tax certificates third-party authorization. So um, we didn't include those because they're very, very self-explanatory. They just have the new titles of the milestones. I'll let you talk about our date guide. So like your um, interactive contract where we put in the dates and deadlines and kind of help figure it all out for you, this kind of shows you where we come up with those days and gives you a little more broad um, maybe one to three days versus us being very specific and telling you exactly. So we're going to put this form one, we'll, we'll email it out to everybody, but we'll actually put it in our interactive packets. We'll have it on Elevate and everything just to give you a little more flexibility uh, in figuring out how do I do my dates and deadlines? How do I structure this? Uh, this is a great little uh, form that we got from uh, Cox, which I'm guessing is Damien Cox. Damien Cox. But yeah, because yeah, a lot of you are going to have questions. How do I structure that water rights <coughs> review or mineral rights review? Does Do I do that with the title deadline? Do I do it with the inspection deadline? Does it require more time? Um, how short should the new loan terms deadline be? So yeah, that's definitely going to help you. And like you said, that gives more flexibility to you guys because my interactive contract is very specific. I don't have the ability to be flexible with that template. So yeah, very helpful little tool. And then I did want to circle back on Ray's question. So it was um, regarding seller leaseback. Is there something in there about insurance obligation? And that is all outlined in the post-closing occupancy agreement. They did not add any new language to the contract to buy and sell, but all of the insurance obligations and what the seller will do and what the buyer will do, and there's still those checkbox, post-closing occupancy agreement didn't change at all this for 2022. So you still um, have the insurance obligations listed out there. And the post-closing does have um, an additional amendment section, additional provisions where you can modify and uh, even make those more strict. I thought there was another question that came up. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Ray. Thank you for that. And John says, does this take the place of the amend extend? And that is a no answer on that termination extension document. Um, that is just uh, for amending dates. You'll still use your amend extend for other extensions. And if you know, like say day three, you know, you guys got to bump your closing date because the seller's going to be out of town. You can use a regular amend extend for things that are really far out. Um, you don't have to use that termination combination. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really in the event that somebody doesn't agree, you're out. Yeah. But if you can always throw out an amend and go, hey, we'd like to do this. And if they said, no, we don't want to, okay. Fine. You, you, I mean, it doesn't mean you want to cancel a contract. So yeah, you still got both tools. Yeah, exactly. And use those amends again for modifying names for buyers and sellers. If there's right. a misspelling, modifying property addresses, adding in additional provisions, changing loan terms, things like that. So that was a lot, you guys. Woo. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Any other questions? Let us know. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of this information is going to come up in the mandatory update as well. So you'll get another preview of that. And then, like we said, we'll update all of our example contracts um, so that you guys have them. Which I'm going to throw out real quick. I will be teaching the mandatory update in January. January. Do not have the date yet. Um, haven't even taken it yet. We get train the trainer here next month, um, but I will be teaching it. I'm going to try and do it live and virtual. We're going to do hybrid. We're going to do a hybrid. Mm -hmm. It's going to be free. I'm now going to be teaching through Smedra. I've been teaching through Frascona where I had to charge. 
I'll be teaching through Smedra, where you guys do know that it's been free uh, education. If you're not a member of Smedra, it's still going to be free because Todd's doing it for free. So <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not charging Todd, Smedra for me to charge. So yeah. Uh, so regardless of who you belong to, I will be teaching the course free, which I always like it if you guys take it from us, just so that we can make sure that you've got the backing of us and our interpretation of things. Yeah, and this will be for equity agents only. Just yeah, this is only equity. Through, yeah. Smedra will be able to really dig into what does our brokerage firm recommend, and we can have those dialogues when we don't have other company agent agents in attendance. Yeah, because I'm so. sure you've taken the course before, and they say always say, you know, check with your broker, check, you know. So. Check with your company policy. Yeah, so, so we'll get into We'll get the order. date and deadline out for when we will be doing that, and uh, get yeah. you guys off to a good start for January. But yeah, that's exciting to be able to do I'm excited to do it for free. Yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's awesome. And and hybrid. So yeah, yeah. we'll uh, probably in, I don't know, one of, the, one of the conference rooms at Smedra is we'll, where we'll do it though. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, More on that to come. Yep. Hey, you do know that we still do surveys and we love it. You guys are filling out the surveys. How are we doing? Getting back to you, all that good stuff. What classes you want? Um, and then we do the little drawing. And uh, we just had uh, Biba win 250 bucks. Yeah, so third place fun. winner. So yeah. don't forget, these are monthly drawings. Fill out those closed transaction surveys. So 1,500 and We've had a lot of people win this thing. Yeah. So, um, a little holiday spending money. Yeah, kind of fun. So yeah, congrats. Exciting. Speaking of the holidays, holidays, just around the corner. Uh, so we are launching a holiday party this year after not being able to do one last year. Oh. We're excited. So God, it feels like it's been years. It does feel like it's been years. So yeah. mark your calendar for Friday, December 3rd from five to seven. We are taking up pretty much Smedra yeah. <laughs> after hours. We're gonna have the kitchen area, high top tables, the fireplace, indoor and outdoor, the big conference room with big round tables, Christmas decorations. We're catering in a full dinner. Um, so it's not just gonna be appetizers and hors d'oeuvres. It will be a full spread. Um, we're actually going to do something a little fun this year and have live music. Well, music. Ish. Yeah. Music. DJ. We're looking at a DJ. Um, we're going to have some games, prizes, raffle, and this is open to your families. So we want yeah. you to bring your spouses, bring your girlfriends, bring your boyfriends, bring your significant other, bring your kids. We're going to have kids activities and a way for kids to win prizes and stuff too. So. Yeah, we're, we're just ready. We're so ready for a, a fun party, getting together and uh, yeah, splurging. So yeah, let's, uh, let's have fun. Looking forward to seeing you guys. So that'll be obviously in person. Yep. January, me teaching the ACU will be the sales meeting for January. We'll take up so that we're not a meeting, 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 meeting. Exactly. And then we'll, we'll start hosting these live events. Uh, we're just, we're there. So um, more and more uh, getting getting in front of everybody. Uh, with that, Paul is still sick. Paul got very, yeah. he, he got very sick. So those of you that don't yeah. know, Paul did, um, he has COVID and yeah, he's down and out. Not in the hospital, nothing like nope. that, but just, just knock very, him very sick. down. Yeah, so. so hopefully we'll get him back next week. Um, Cause yeah, he's, uh, yeah. Recovering. Got, he's got no energy. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So send him your thoughts. Yeah. He'll be he'll be fine. Just yeah, bad. Yeah. <laughs> not not good. So yeah. A couple other announcements regarding license renewal and ENO. Yes. Um ENO. Uh again, we cover you guys. So you're gonna get in the mail, Rice and uh Williams. Williams they're, they're good at promoting themselves and making it look like you need to get ENO. Don't buy you're, it. You're covered under our policy, so you don't need to do that. Please make sure that you are getting your licenses renewed. It happens 12, 31, 21, every three years. So it used to be, you know, on your anniversary date, that's gone. It's 12, 31. If you don't know when yours expires, go on to Dora and pull it up and look and see where you're we at. We do not track this for no. you guys because you're all on different schedules. 
Yeah. So yeah, get that um, license renewed. We have had people go expired because yeah. they're not paying attention and we don't want to do that. And then it's a pretty exorbitant fee to reinstate. So yep. you're going to want to avoid that. You can actually go online and start renewing now. However, you are going to need a copy of your e &O insurance. Our policy currently runs through the 27th of this month and we should have the new policy um, yep, I just had a meeting with the owners and we've got our new policy, so we'll, we should have it here shortly. Yep, so hang tight if you need to renew your license until we get you a copy of that new e &O, because it's only going to let you go so far. So. Yeah. Anything else on that? Please keep up on your education, people. <laughs> I mean, they're doing a ton of audits. I'd say we have 10 to 15 audits per month in our office. Yeah. And I hate to say it, but we probably have 10% of the agents that aren't keeping up on it and then they have to do more education or yeah. pay a fine and it's just so a hassle. Make sure so. you're doing your annual mandatory update and doing your extra 12 total, um, credits. total credits. So a total of 24 every renewal cycle. Oh, well, we got a next sales meeting. We're going to get rid of that. I think Paul jumped the gun because yeah, so we we're hoping, we have it we're on the hoping calendar. to do that for the ACU. But. Yeah, so we're looking at booking that date. It's going to be smudger availability and making sure that we can get you trained up quick enough. Um, well, I'll be ready. <laughs> so pencil it in for Wednesday, January 12th. Um, it won't be a sales meeting. It'll be the mandatory update instead. So Which is we'll shoot for that. Four hours. It'll be fun, though. <laughs> we'll, we'll both do it. I, I'm going to get you certified, too. Oh, yikes. Yeah. Yikes. Hey, congratulations, award winners. Another amazing month. Um, yeah, October. Yeah, just people are crushing it. You guys are just doing amazing. So congratulations. I think Liliana was even on here. I don't know if she's still on here. If you are, say, nice job, Liliana, with four transactions. Yeah, she carried the torch for most transaction award yeah, that's out of the BTC awesome. office. And then top sales, uh, Biba with 2.5 million out of three transactions. That's just awesome. Mm -hmm. And then we have many others that have three transactions, but she got the top sales for the volume and number of transactions combined. <clears throat> so way to go. But Sandra also three transactions, Mark Baker with three transactions. Todd Smith, I see you were online with three transactions. Congratulations. Congrats. Uh, Elizabeth, three transactions. Stephanie, three mm -hmm. transactions. Well, I mean, that's that's October. It's supposed yeah. to be slowing down supposedly. <laughs> and I think we had a record month again. Um, you guys aren't slowing down. Yeah. So everyone else, Power Pro, two transactions. Um, Callie Hepker, Allison Lashman, Caitlin Tran, Karina Podensny, Eric Dannenbaum, Wendy Bruner. Um, Wendy's husband is having some medical issues right now, kind of scary times right now. So keep her in your prayers. Uh, Karen Beisner, Two transactions, congratulations, Priscilla Welch, Briggs the Newbie, Doug Frew, you're on, my Doug, Nicole Warden, Justin Savoy, Vicky Opapari, and Ricky Lee, all of you power pros, yeah. crushing it. Well done. Yeah, proud of you guys, doing awesome. Yeah, keep up the great work. I'm going to check questions because I think there were a couple oh, more that okay. came in. If you have a new or coming soon listing, Put it on the comment section. Let us all know about it, please. And then we're going to take a quick look and see. Oh, so yeah, we had a couple people asking about Paul. So oh, I'm glad right. that we were able to, to fill you guys in on that. He's hanging in there. He's hanging in there and he has a very positive, you know, Paul. He's I always mean, positive. He's like, but... I'm doing good. How are you guys? And it's like, <laughs> you no, you're not doing good. And his wife has us. to go around outside and look through the window to see. I mean, they've got him quarantined. quarantined. He's quarantined. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. God but you'll him. see, if, you know, if you're reaching out to him for certain things, he's forwarding a lot to Todd and I because he just he's he's yeah, so tired so <laughs> tired but you there. may get a couple emails from him and he's going to seem real chipper and cheer and yeah he's you just know he's <laughs> he's on the mend but struggling um so kevin lewis do you need to put na in the lines that don't change so i never like having blank lines in contracts i always recommend putting na however it does say in the various forms if an item is left blank it is assumed that it is it's the same changing. thing. Yep. It's not changing. But it, so, it makes us nervous when we review contracts. Did you mean to leave it blank or you missed it? Yeah. So I like to 
filling yeah. it in. And even on your amend extends, go ahead and just NA all the way down um, so that we know you didn't mean to change multiple deadlines and um, overlooked it. So yeah. So you know that you didn't overlook it. Yeah. Perfect. Looks like a couple people have received Dora um, renewal notifications. So that's good. And Doug's last name is pronounced free. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Uh, <laughs> free. That's a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. So if there's anything else you guys need, pop it in the comment section here as we wrap up. We definitely want to see those new listings. Please put your links in there, um, promo your properties, add photos, um, and let's see if we can get some equity agents working together on some sales in yeah. this fourth quarter. Awesome. Well, you guys have a wonderful week. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Around the corner, we're actually going to be in Florida next week, mm -hmm. seeing my sister for an early Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So, yeah. We didn't want to travel during the actual holidays. It's yeah. crazy traveling. If you're traveling during the holidays, be safe. And we are beyond excited to see you yes, guys for the holiday so ready. party. It's going to be here before you know it. So, so yeah, please put that down on your calendar. Yeah. And shoot us an RSVP just so it helps me with food orders. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're on the fence and you don't know if you're going to be able to make it, um, you can come without an RSVP, but a headcount just helps me with making sure we have plenty of food and drink. So awesome. You guys. Thanks guys. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. <laughs>